Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the formative years of folk art and minor art practice in India started with a different purpose. It was meant for the ritualistic and customary performances uh, as a masked behavior of a society. Uh, so, the practice was commonly known as a community practice, though the images had some decorative quality into it, but it was not made for a purely aesthetic purpose. Self-expression was the secondary factor that worked uh, behind the mind of its creators for a very long time. Having said that, I must also mention that it is very recently that uh, maybe a 50 years uh, of a span that uh, we may consider when this aesthetic and utility, these two things are separated and the aesthetic purpose is taken out and right now we are giving a serious uh, thought about its aesthetic aspect. We are finding out the need, the new need of this particular art practice purely from its aesthetic qualities. Uh, it is true that the variant of stylistic aspects that are involved with this art practice gives us new direction. There are contemporary artists who are trained in a purely academic manner in the mainstream practice. They are also realizing the richness of this folk and minor art uh, and their aesthetics and they are picking up many of their virtues in their own uh, artistic practices. So, there lies its significance and perhaps we have discussed and mentioned it quite a few times in our earlier lectures and we need to say that repeatedly to emphasize on this point because from this particular point onwards we are going to uh, take a different perspective towards the aesthetic components of uh, this art works and will also connect it with the regular visual culture that we are living with and with that reference we are going to assess the aesthetic virtues that can have some modern uh, qualities into it and with that modernity and the contemporary means it can go long and survive for more time with uh, some paradigm shift. It can also uh, face the new challenges of the new time. So, let us look at it from a purely aesthetic perspective and try to understand the nature of the practice uh, from the aesthetic perspective. So, I am going to show you a few images and through the images we will try to see how they are in today's time. So, I am showing you some very recent photographs as the documentation uh, that I have done to make this topic more clear to you. Seen in the pictures are the temples of the place named Shri Kalahasti. This is near Chennai in the southern part of India. This is a place which is mostly very famous for its traditional artwork known as Kalamkari painting. The Kalamkari tradition here are the hand painted one. There is another variation of this Kalamkari which are meant as printing. 
there the block printing done on textile uh, surfaces, but that gets practiced in a different location uh, named Machalipattinam, but this is Srikalahasti where the practitioner use a different technique and uh, they make a pen of their own and create images that acts as uh, souvenir and the backdrops and they are connected to the temple tradition, they are meant for the purpose of worship and that way it got popularized many years back and the practice is still on. So, this is the temple and as we can see that uh, the motifs of the temples are also having lots of intricate details in it, but overall it has uh, a structure, a shrine like temple top that unites the entire thing. So, it is like a combination of symmetry and asymmetry throughout. It has some uh, emphasis on symmetry, but the intricacy of the images inside are also uh, quite distinctive. So, overall it gives us a complicated structure, it is not very simple and easily uh, readable. Uh, design at all. So, that is the temple top, a detail of that image which is a very freshly painted although the temple is almost 900 years old as they say it is not an authentic data, but nearly authentic. Seen here is a practitioner of the Kalamkari technique which is done on uh, fabric uh, either cotton or silk, they also use crepe these days. Uh, so, the person, the painter is holding a pen in his hand, which is a handmade pen uh, that holds a lot of vegetable dye at one time and it flows from here. So, the images are made with continuous line drawings. The documentation is done from a nearby place in an artist's workshop. The workshop is guided by a, a master artisan whose name is M. Nagaraja. And this person who is shown in the picture, he is one apprentice uh, who is also quite a senior apprentice who is working under uh, some guru or the master painter. And he has also expertised in the technique and he is working as per the need of the, uh, the of the customers. Uh, here he is making a part of a sari uh, which is partially block printed that comes from a different place and there is one empty space where he is using his own vegetable dyes and uh, executing the image. And in the detail in the inset, uh, you can see how he is pressing the one part of the brush and the ink is flowing from there, he is dipping it into the vegetable dyed black ink. And we are going to discuss all this method and material uh, in some later uh, uh, module, in some lectures in detail. Now, let us see the stylistic uh, variation that uh, it gives us. So, this is one cloth which is made as a backdrop and what we see in the picture is uh, a scene from Mahabharat. Uh, however, what we see in the picture is a very interesting space division which has a horizontal emphasis throughout to tell stories. Uh, so, it is all about the narrative that is taking place there uh, and there are images which are telling us the story of the creators. They also make images for commercial purposes. Uh, seen in the picture is a motif of a bird uh, that is repeated in a cloth and they are hand painted. They are not printed, but they are almost identical. These particular motifs are often sold separately and then embroidered in different um, artifacts, but these are purely hand painted uh, 
images that are still in practice. And this is a documentation that is done uh, very recently. Another one before filling up the colors. So, what they do is they again make the line drawings and then they fill up certain areas with color often they leave it just like this they do not fill up the areas with color. Uh, here they have used certain uh, other colors also which is a light brown here. So, when you uh, go out of this workshop uh, where people are working with some customers need they supplied to the government emporiums and they have a fixed market. Uh, they also knew how to make imageries and it is like uh, there are different uh, households where they have workshops uh, which are approved by the government of India and also uh, it is a cluster of artists who live there and they have been practicing for a very long time. This is right outside the household in the roadside areas where we also see that uh, there is this customary ritual that is being practiced every day. So, we see the uh, floor decorations with rice powder that they do as part of their daily life every morning on the floor no matter how wealthy the lifestyles are, uh, but this is for sure that they make it. On the road these are the common features there. This is one image that is clicked in a museum. As we discussed about the contextualization and decontextualization, this is perhaps another very interesting example of there, where in a museum the household uh, space is artificially created and the ritual and the practice is preserved for public viewing another image clicked in the museum Dakshin Chitra. So, with this images we get a fair amount of idea about the clusters of uh, folk art and minor art practices that are still alive and uh, thriving. Uh, so, it is there that we are not basically creating uh, a cultural community who are living in isolation, but they are well blended in a uh, community place. It, this is a small town where there is a temple and the tradition was connected to the temple, it is still on in a different form. They are catering to a different market, there are different stakeholders who are patronizing and uh, helping to carry it further. Uh, but this is also for sure that uh, it is not happening the way it used to happen when it had a regular use. So, we will see more photographs from the museum where some old specimens are also preserved uh, and we will try to match that with the recent documentation that is done and we will see how the mixed culture is uh, nurturing the tradition which are existing and this is also true that in Kalamkari Shri Kalahasti we do not see much changes. Uh, there are quite a few variations that are there and we are going to discuss that in detail in some other lecture, but uh, the changes are very limited, uh, but it is more like they are not uh, creating changes or they are not bringing new subject matters in their creation uh, quite intentionally. Uh, they might be uh, fearing for the market. At the same time, I will share some experience from one of the interview that I conducted with M. Nagaraja. In his interview, he uh, replied uh, for one of my question where I wanted to know that uh, how happy he is with the kind of earning that uh, he is able to um, manage with this uh, his creations. Uh, he mentioned quite a few things to me that is uh, uh, quite a eye opener and I feel 
I may also um, share that idea with you that uh, in his statement he said that uh, he creates for the sake of it, but there are many students who are working under him. Uh, there are many people who work in the direction that is guided by him and for them uh, they only produce. So, there are certain hierarchies where a person imagines and innovates and the other people they are skilled laborers, they are artisans and these are the terms that uh, are not very well clarified in uh, the modern society. So, often this masterminds are known as artisans only because they are not trained in a academic style. They have their own rules and regulations, but um, we are ignorant of it in many instances and for that we feel that uh, these people they do it very intuitively, but this is for sure that it is a community practice and like any other community practice people in the community they are well equipped with uh, the skill that the traditional practice uh, provides them with, but this is also true that not all of them can think innovatively or create new things every day. It is also true that uh, to cope up with the market sometimes their works uh, lose its soul, its expression uh, because of the reputation, because of the repeated market demand. They need to reduce prices to sell it in the market, otherwise if there are too many unsold things lying in one place uh, because of convenience of production, uh, if you produce more than the demand then they lie and they do not get sold off. So, this is just a very different way of looking at it, but the master painter Nagaraja for him he said that he gets something out of it which is very precious and he cannot tell me materially that how much satisfied he is with the kind of earning that uh, he has. Uh, though he, his earning is secured, he has his award money and it is also true that there are fixed market for him, but it does not really matter to him and he creates for the sake of it. This is one technique that he has mastered uh, from his ancestors and he feels that he lives for this practice and it does not really matter to him whether Manjusha or any other government emporium is uh, helping him or not. He is thankful that he is getting some support, but uh, had there a case where nobody is helping him, uh, he would have still continued with uh, his creation. So, that is very positive to know. Uh, also, upon asking about the sustainability or the uh, longevity, the life of this practice, he gave me a very interesting answer. For him, he says that it depends on your faith. If you feel something will survive, it will survive. If we say it will not survive, it will not survive. So, the answers are simply like that, which is much beyond the rationality or the basic logic, but it has a deeper or greater understanding uh, that keeps it going. So, let us go back and see the place and try to understand the uh, ethos, the values that are intrinsically connected to the practice uh, to understand the subject better and effectively. These are the images. Uh, from the older practices which I picked up from the museum just to understand whether the existing uh, techniques, the aesthetics uh, that is there in the prevalent uh, practices in that particular zone uh, is reflective on the other works or not. So, what we see there is that uh, in the paintings in some of those furniture based uh, wooden works, uh, their narrative and their quality, it has a central deity uh, 
which are taken from different religious cultures, of course, we can make out that the image at the right hand side of the picture is a image from a Christianity or based tradition, where the other one is the he is from Hindu tradition. Uh, they have that religious identity very distinctively connected to it, but both the works are not very typical and they have some uniqueness into it that made it very rare and uh, worth uh, preserving into a museum space. Some other works, uh, here too we get to see two Kalamkari pieces and uh, one has a typical Andhra influence that is part of the, uh, because Sri Kalahasti is situated in Andhra Pradesh though it is very close to the Tamil Nadu Andhra Pradesh border, but this is a tradition which is uh, which belongs to Andhra Pradesh solely. Uh, but uh, in the other picture we see that there is a uh, strong western Indian influence in it, uh, but it is done in the Kalamkari manner uh, in the picture. Uh, that is because this particular tradition was patronized by the Maharashtrian kings. And then uh, if we go back to the story, we will understand the historical connections, but right now we are purely concentrating on the aesthetics and trying to understand the aesthetic idioms that is uh, th th that creates the dialogue between uh, the identity, between the perspective, between the pleasure that we get uh, out of the uh, out of uh, this kind of a view viewing experience. And it is all about the experience that is uh, that enriches us from uh, this creations. The next one is also uh, another textile piece which is preserved in the museum. It is done in an applique technique uh, which is very close to the uh, applique of Odisha. Uh, and these are the states which are very closely uh, situated one after another. So, uh, if we go and see the map, we can figure out that Odisha, uh, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, uh, they had some connection. So, there are, uh, there had been, there are possible exchanges that took place there or uh, these are something which uh, can be hypothetically uh, put here. There is no authentic uh, uh, documents. Uh, that can tell us the exact reason why these people tried this kind of epics on cloth and when they did it uh, under which circumstances. But these are for sure some of the backdrops from a temple where two birds are worshipping Shiva. Uh, we saw the same bird motifs which is a peacock. Uh, in the textile that is uh, that I showed in the uh, previous slides. Uh, so, the motive is very common, the technique is completely different, but it gives us the aesthetic quality of a typical Kalamkari cloth, though the technique is different here. There are other images from another tradition uh, which is following the same kind of figuration only. When we see the images here, uh, they are made on a different surface. So, the material is different, it is done on a, uh, these are leather puppets done on leather uh, with vegetable dyes again uh, and they are made for shadow puppetry tradition there. Uh, but when we look at it, we see that they are following the same stylistic orientation throughout. These are some old examples of Tanjore painting which took place in Tanjavur and in Tanjur painting what we see that uh, as we said in the beginning of the lecture that uh, they were known to be the uh, jewel embedded artworks. So, they used a lot of precious and semi precious stones as well as gold and other precious metals in those paintings. They were patronized by the uh, Maharashtrian rulers of uh, those time who uh, lived in the southern part of India. 
uh, but what we see is the similar kind of a linear figuration and the quality uh, where the space division is almost symmetrical and it is all filled up with uh, human figures uh, with some simplified and roundish voluminous uh, at the same time uh, flat and two dimensional decorative qualities and uh, they are very intricate, they have variation in color, in style, in poses and postures, uh, but there is a basic balance which is emphasized on the symmetry because of its space division. And also there are shrines, uh, the temple tops which are taken from the uh, temple structures of that particular region. In the contemporary murals of Kerala, we see that uh, the figurations are uh, partially taken from the same style, but it also has a lot of uh, foreign influences into it in terms of the uh, their figuration, their stylistic features, where we see that uh, it looks more like the artworks from the uh, far east, namely. Uh, Java, Borneo, Sumatra, Indonesia and so on. So, uh, that is because they had a trade route and uh, their artwork came here, the textile technique of Java Batik and Kalamkari, they had some uh, trade uh, based connection and uh, Kalamkari was a technique which uh, is uh, believed to be uh, practiced uh, from a Iranian origin. And we also saw this kind of a vegetable diet cloth. There are evidences that in Indus Valley civilization they use the same technique. So, we do not really know its origin, but here we are looking at the aesthetic aspects uh, purely and uh, with some involvement. So, these are the details, and we can make out from its figuration that uh, it has a typical uh, way of execution with a lot of sophistication. And the techniques uh, are purely fresco based, which are done directly on the weight plaster with vegetable colors, the oxide based powder colors with some binder. In this picture, we see a pure textile of Telia Ramal uh, that is a woven ikat. Uh, it has a complex method of weaving with lots of variation. And we also see in the murals uh, which are framed and there are reflections because of uh, the glass framed um, glass frame that are there. But we can see the suggestion of this kind of textiles in their borders. So, textile and figures and the textile techniques uh, and drawings, uh, they were a combined aesthetics that was there in the tradition. And then I will show you another image which is very recent and these are the kind of cloth that they are selling uh, in the local uh, stationery shops, uh, where the temple visitors now are not into buying the real Kalamkari uh, because of this um, um, like for the ritualistic purposes. Uh, they need to buy things, but what we see here there are handkerchiefs which are getting sold and they have some block printed uh, and often silk screen printed uh, images that has the Kalamkari aesthetics in it. Uh, so, they are often taken to the temple to cover the uh, offerings and they are also used for many different purposes uh, and they are the shops which are very close to the temple. There are also shops close to the temples where we see that the aesthetic is completely changed. So, they no longer adhere to the old Kalamkari technique, but the images have certain uh, qualities which are typical of that place. So, to look at them from a purely aesthetic uh, perspective, it gives us some new direction uh, as like how where it stands in the uh, prevailing uh, visual culture and for visual culture study it is very important to see how these cultural practices are 
uh, leaving and growing into a common place. Uh, because uh, this is also true that it is not our aim to create a cultural pocket uh, which is confined and uh, there should be free flow of interaction of this artisans, the art practitioners, its connoisseurs, the patrons and also uh, the community uh, at large. Uh, this is something that we can understand that when a place is known for its uh, traditional art, uh, the dwellers of that particular place uh, may choose some other profession, but they cannot be totally ignorant of the existence of that practice. So, by uh, patronizing that practice, we contribute to the growth of a community where the aesthetic sensibilities are strong. So, uh, this is for sure that the aesthetic sensibility of a place gets influenced by its artistic tradition uh, and the vice versa.